I want to talk about the Kramer's chronic relations, which are bidirectional mathematical relations connecting the real and imaginary parts of any complex function that is analytic in the upper half plane. Now this sounds quite abstract, but these relations are actually incredibly useful in physics. So we're going to motivate them from a physicist's point of view, and then we're going to derive them. So why do we as physicists need the Kramer's chronic relations? The answer to that is actually just three words. Linear response theory. Consider a physical system where you have any observable, let's call it O, that depends on a time t. And let's say that observable is always measured as a difference from equilibrium. So you have the system, the system is at equilibrium, but you can actually apply some perturbation to it. And that perturbation leads to the observable O being different from its equilibrium value. And what we're interested in is how much that perturbation actually disturbs the observable. You can think of the observable as polarization or current and of the perturbation as electric field. Or you can think of the observable as magnetization and the perturbation as an exterior magnetic field. Now we propose a relation between the observable and the perturbation. So let's write the perturbation with a function f and let's see how the value of the perturbation at time t prime affects the value of the observable at time t. And we do this by multiplying by a function chi that depends on the difference of these two times. So it's chi of t minus t prime. And this gives us the effect of the perturbation at t prime on the observable at time t. Now since the perturbation has some structure in time and can, in principle, stretch from minus infinity to infinity, we have to sum over all these times t prime, or more precisely we have to integrate over t prime. So this collects all the contributions at all times t prime of the perturbation on the value of the observable at time t. Now there are a few important things I want you to notice about this expression. First of all, there is no location vector. We could write a vector r as an argument of O, so that the observable is measured at some location in space, but then we would have to write the same location as an argument for f. So the value of the observable only depends on the value of the perturbation at that exact point in space. So this theory is local. You could in principle extend this so that the perturbation can influence the observable at a different location, but that's not what we're doing here. Second, Notice that if we scale up the perturbation, let's say by some factor 2, the observable will also scale by a factor 2. Whatever factor we scale the perturbation, the observable will scale with the same factor. This is why this is a linear theory. Thirdly, this function chi cannot be completely general. What if t prime is actually larger than t? In that case, the observable would be influenced by the perturbation at some later point in time. Well, that doesn't make sense because the future cannot influence the past according to our current understanding of the universe. So what we have to impose is that this function chi of t minus t prime is zero whenever t minus t prime is less than zero. Also, it must not grow faster than t minus t prime to the power of x, where x is some positive real number, but that's usually fulfilled in meaningful physical systems. But the important restriction is the first one, so we need to preserve causality. And we do that by imposing that chi of t minus t prime equals zero for t minus t prime less than zero. And the final thing I would like you to notice about this expression is that it is a convolution integral. And if you've ever seen such a convolution integral, you probably know that it is transformed into a simple product by a Fourier transform. And whenever such a thing appears, it's usually a good idea to throw a Fourier transform at it and see what happens. So I'm quickly going to uh, introduce my conventions here. So the Fourier transform of a function a is called a tilde of omega. Sometimes people like to leave out the tilde and call the function of frequency by the very same letter as the function of time, which is somewhat imprecise, but usually people mean a 
Fourier transform if they write a function of frequency that previously appeared as a function of time. Anyway, I'm going to write the tilde to avoid any confusion. Now, a tilde of omega, so the Fourier transform, is given as an integral from minus infinity to infinity over time e to the i omega t and a of t. Let's apply this to our observable o of t. So we have o of omega equals integral of minus infinity to infinity dt. Then we have the e to the i omega t. And then I'm just going to write the observable o of t. So there was this integral that I'm going to draw to the front dt prime and then chi of t minus t prime f of t prime. And that's the Fourier transform of O, but I'm going to introduce an e to the minus i omega t prime times e to the plus i omega t prime. So I've just introduced a factor of 1 into the equation, which won't change the value, but it allows us to now define a new variable t double prime equals t minus t prime. And we change our integration over t to an integration over t double prime, which doesn't change the integration interval since it was from minus infinity to infinity anyway. So we still have an integration from minus infinity to infinity over dt double prime, then the integration over t prime from minus infinity to infinity. Then we have an e to the i omega t double prime, a chi of t double prime, an f of t prime, and then we're left with the e to the i omega t prime, because the e to the minus i omega t prime went into this t double prime expression. And now if you take a look at this, we notice that this is nothing but chi tilde of omega times f tilde of omega. So the Fourier transform transformed this convolution integral in a simple product of two functions of frequency. This also tells us that the response of the system to some perturbation can only happen at the same frequency as the perturbation itself. Now the Kramers chronic relations actually have to do with this function chi tilde of omega, which is the linear response function, also called susceptibility sometimes. But first, let us define a new function. We had our chi tilde of omega. We're now going to introduce a new function, which is chi double tilde of z, which is simply an integral that looks very similar to the Fourier transform that we had before. But instead of e to the i omega t, we now write e to the i c t, chi of t, and that c is a complex number. So its real part is just the omega that we had before, but then we add an i delta, so it has an imaginary part. You could also argue that you simply turn that omega to a complex number but I think actually introducing a new function that is now a function of a complex variable is a little more precise. So let's write out what this means. And since chi of t is only non-zero for positive t, we can make this an integral from zero to infinity over dt. And then we have e to the i omega t times e to the minus delta t. And chi of t. Since t will always be positive, this expression cannot blow up as long as delta is chosen positive. And what this tells us is that this function is well behaved in the upper half plane. It's actually analytic in the upper half plane of the complex plane, and this is due to the causality condition that we instated previously. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at a different expression. We're going to take this chi double tilde now let's call the argument of it c prime for a moment and divide this by c prime minus c. Now c prime is the variable and c is just some constant. And I'm going to choose the constant c such that it only has a real part and that real part I'm going to call omega. So we have chi double tilde of c prime 
over c prime minus omega. And omega is just some constant for now. Now let's take this expression, this function. Since chi tilde doesn't have a pole in the upper half plane, this whole expression won't have a pole in the upper half plane either. But it will have a pole along the real axis at c prime equals omega. Let's just draw the complex plane here real quick. So this is the imaginary axis, this is the real axis, and there will be a pole right here at omega. Now let's integrate this function, this whole expression here, over some closed path in the complex plane. Now let this integral run over the real axis right here until we hit the pole then go around it in an infinitesimally small half circle, like that, and then continue all the way up along the real axis to infinity. Then make an infinitely large half circle and come to the real axis at minus infinity. And then finish up this integral along the real axis. So this is our integration path. Let's just introduce a direction on this path. And notice something very important. Since this is a closed path in the complex plane and this function has no residues within that path, this whole integral is going to be zero. So the sum of all contributions to that integral is going to be zero. Now let's look at that infinitely large half circle up here. Either the real or the imaginary part of C prime is infinite at that point. If the real part of C prime is infinite at that point, that corresponds to arbitrarily large oscillations. And we assume that the answer to arbitrarily large oscillations is always going to be zero, because any real physical system just can't follow these infinitely fast oscillations. If the imaginary part of C prime is infinite, this corresponds to delta going to infinity, which obviously suppresses this term right here and makes chi double tilde zero as well. So there's no contribution from this infinite radius half circle. So all the contributions come from the integral over the real axis and this little half circle here. So let me quickly delete some of this. So we have the integral over that real axis, except for the pole, and the integral over this little infinitesimally small half circle. And together they are zero. So I'm going to write the principal value of the integral from minus infinity to infinity and now we're integrating over c prime on the real axis and along the real axis c prime can also be written as omega prime since the real part of this complex variable was denoted by omega. We're integrating chi double tilde of actually c prime but again we can write omega prime and since this is now a real argument the function chi double tilde actually agrees with the function chi tilde. So we can delete one of these tildes and have just the function chi tilde of omega prime left. And that's over omega prime minus omega. And it's the principal value because we can't just integrate over the real axis because there's this pole here. So what we instead do is we integrate until we are arbitrarily close to that pole then we cut off the integration interval and then we continue the integration arbitrarily close to the pole after the pole. But we leave out the actual pole. So that's why we need to write the principal value here. Now this integral plus the integration over this little half circle here. And now we really need to write the integration over this complex variable c prime because this half circle actually does extend into the complex plane of chi double tilde of c prime over c prime minus omega and the sum of both of these contributions is zero. Now let's think about this second integral real quick. Since this half circle is arbitrarily small and the function chi double tilde is actually well behaved, we can simply replace its evaluation at c prime by an evaluation at the singularity at the pole omega. So we can just draw out the chi tilde of omega in front of the integral and we're left with the integral over this half circle over dc prime of 1 over c prime minus omega. Now notice that c prime in this case 
just equals to omega plus e to the i phi times epsilon, where epsilon is the radius of this circle that we can make arbitrarily small. And so dc prime just equals to i e to the i phi epsilon d phi, which makes this integral just chi tilde of omega times the integral over the half circle d phi i e to the i phi epsilon over c prime minus omega, which is nothing but e to the i phi epsilon. Now we simply have the integral of i d phi over this half circle, but notice that the direction we went through this half circle was like this. The standard direction of integration and the direction that the value of phi positively increases in is actually this. So what we get is an additional minus. So we get minus chi tilde of omega i and then simply the integration of phi over half the circle which is pi. So now let's put this together. So we now have chi tilde of omega times i equals 1 over pi times the principal value of the integral of minus infinity to infinity integral over omega prime chi tilde of omega prime over omega prime minus omega. Now note that of course our observable as a function of time was a real function and our perturbation as a function of time was a real function and our linear response function or susceptibility as a function of time was a real function. But since we introduced the Fourier transform we actually transform these into complex functions. So chi tilde actually has a real and an imaginary part. And we can write these out. So we have i times i times the imaginary part just gives minus imaginary part chi tilde of omega plus i times the real part of chi tilde of omega equals 1 over pi principal value integral minus infinity to infinity d omega prime real part of chi tilde of omega prime plus i times the imaginary part of chi tilde omega prime over omega prime minus omega. Note that this expression of course has to agree both in its real and in its imaginary part. So we actually get two equations from this. So what we get is that the real part chi tilde of omega equals 1 over pi principal value of integral from minus infinity to infinity d omega prime times the imaginary part of chi tilde of omega prime over omega prime minus omega. And the imaginary part of chi tilde of omega equals minus 1 over pi principal value of the integral from minus infinity to infinity d omega prime. Now we just compare the real part of the expression below. So we get real part of chi tilde of omega prime over omega prime minus omega. And that's it. That's what's known as the Kramers chronic relations. So, are we done here? Well, not quite, since these integrations include integration over a negative frequency. And you're going to ask, how are we going to probe our system with a negative frequency? How are we going to create a perturbation with a negative frequency? And the answer is, we can't and we won't, but we also don't need to. We're just going to rewrite these equations a little. So first of all, note that the real and imaginary part of chi tilde, as we obtained chi tilde from the Fourier transform, can be written as, for the real part, 1 half times chi tilde of omega plus the complex conjugate of chi tilde of omega, which is nothing but 1 half integral over dt chi of t and then 
e to the i omega t plus e to the minus i omega t. And what we see from this is that if we now replace omega with minus omega, what we get is the very same function. So the real part of chi tilde of omega is also the real part of chi tilde of minus omega. So the real part of chi tilde is an even function of omega. Now let's do the same for the imaginary part. So the procedure is the same other that we now subtract the complex conjugate and we divide by i here, which doesn't really matter. We still have this integral over dt. But note that now if we replace omega with minus omega, we actually change the overall sign of that expression. So we have imaginary part of chi tilde of omega equals minus the imaginary part of chi tilde of minus omega. So the imaginary part of chi tilde is actually an odd function of omega. And we're now going to make use of this. So let us simply take our expression for the real part of chi tilde and just multiply by omega prime plus omega over omega prime plus omega. So just multiply by 1, which obviously doesn't change the expression, but we can now multiply out the numerator and denominator. And we arrive at the following expression. So the real part of chi tilde of omega equals 1 over pi principal value of minus infinity infinity d omega prime omega prime times the imaginary part of chi tilde omega prime over omega prime squared minus omega squared plus, let's put brackets here, omega times the imaginary part of chi tilde of omega prime over omega prime squared minus omega squared. Our integration goes over omega prime. So let's look at the structure of these expressions as functions of omega prime. So we have omega prime times the imaginary part of chi tilde of omega prime over omega prime squared minus something. So omega prime squared is always going to be an even function. We don't need to worry about this. Omega prime is an odd function and the imaginary part, as we said, is also an odd function. So in total, this is going to be an even function in omega prime. This, however, only contains the imaginary part, which is an odd function, over this omega prime, which is an even function. So altogether, this is an odd function of omega prime. And since this odd function is integrated over a symmetric interval, minus infinity to infinity, this whole contribution becomes zero. And this contribution can actually be evaluated by just integrating from zero to infinity and introducing a factor two in front. So we now have the integral of omega prime imaginary part of chi tilde of omega prime over omega prime squared minus omega squared. And we only need to integrate from zero to infinity over positive frequencies, which is much more meaningful. Let's apply the same procedure to the imaginary part. So, introduce that omega prime plus omega over omega prime plus omega, and just multiply these expressions out. So we get omega prime times the real part plus omega times the real part of chi tilde over omega prime squared minus omega squared. All right. Now the real part, as we recall, was an even function of omega prime. Omega prime itself is an odd function, so we get an odd function in total here. Here we have omega prime only in the square, which is even. The real part is even, so this is an even function. So 
this part vanishes and we just can take the contribution from the even integral twice and integrate from zero to infinity again. So let's just replace that one with a two and have the principal value of the integral from zero to infinity d omega prime omega real part chi tilde omega prime over omega prime squared minus omega squared. And that's an expression for the imaginary part that only relies on integration over positive frequencies. So let me just clean this up a little and write out the expressions that we derived. So there you have it, the Kramers chronic relations in full glory expressed only as integrations over positive frequencies. And if we now happen to know the imaginary part of chi tilde, we can get the real part just by carrying out this integration. And if we happen to know the real part, we could get the imaginary part. So measuring either is enough to get information about the whole susceptibility or linear response function, which is really helpful. And this is why physicists like these relations so much.